you're here to hear Michael Matzdorf. And Michael worked on a little film. I don't know what they call that thing. Uh, it was something about the iris or shutter or Fight, focus. Focus, Fight yeah. Okay. Fight Club. And uh, what's fascinating is Michael started the project in 10 What was it? 10 10.08. Yeah. And probably in a crazy move, mid-project, you go, yeah, let's do this 10, 10 one thing. <laughs> right? Yeah, that was about right. But you know how they always say, I talk to people all the time and say, oh, yeah, no, 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 I couldn't possibly upgrade my software because I'm working on my child's birthing video and <laughs> I'm still on 6.5. How old is your kid? 18. Really? Dude, up. You know, so anyway, you did, everybody says it's dangerous and not a smart thing to not do. Not recommended. You don't recommend all. it. But it worked. And I got to say, I've heard you talk about little bits of this, and when you get into the sub roles and the stuff you keep track of, I can't even wrap my head around. So, why don't we start? All right. Tell us what you tell us what you did, and then we'll start breaking down into little littler pieces. All right. Thanks, Chris. Well, first of all, I made a keynote, and I don't know anything about keynote, um, and so you're, you're going to see some really funky uh, graphics here. So I think I have this uh, switched. I don't know. I'm, it's um, coming over. Okay. I believe. Uh, hold on. It says Mac Pro. I don't know. Where's Sam Messman when you need him? I'm hitting two. It, um, see, no, all right, well, uh, let's, let's, let's talk about this, this while somebody you else need. figures it that out. That will advance your um, slides eventually. Will it? Yeah, but we got to get great. it up here it's first. It's a great radio. Um, <laughs> all right, so we started out, and we were in, um, we were in New Orleans. And uh, we started out with 1008, as Chris said. Uh, we pretty much immediately jumped to 10.09. And we had, uh, they were shooting ProRes, they were doing uh, dual system sound. We were, go it was a regular, a regular movie, and I don't know how many of you are involved in feature world or whatever, but uh, it was a regular movie. All the good things, all the bad things, all the problems, and we were, we were working on uh, one, two, that three, four like IMAX and uh, a couple of laptops at that point, working all around New Orleans, uh, trans, uh, transporting little shuttle drives. And after New Orleans, after the 1009 switch, we moved to Buenos Aires. And there's nothing better than being in a foreign country uh, and deciding to uh, upgrade your software to 101. And um, what we had done is it came out uh, for us. And we were, we were talking about what's going to happen, what's it going to do. It's beautiful. Um, what's it, what's going to happen, what's it going to do. And we ran a test with 52 days of our footage, which is pretty much where we were at that point. Um, and we had it just isolated on a single machine. And it worked actually pretty well. And when we uh, came into a multiple user workflow, we did have some obstacles to jump over. We learned some things. Uh, everybody learned some things, I think, uh, all the way along. But uh, after a couple of weeks of transition and uh, some technical advice from many smart people, Sam, some of the folks at Apple, and the 1011 upgrade, uh, things smoothed out a lot for us. And we pretty much finished the movie on 101 and or 1011, and at the very end went to 1012, which was exactly the software that we wanted <laughs> when we started. Uh, and I was archiving the movie at that point. Um, so that's sort of a, the quick overarching summary of what we did. And um, everything from you know, the dailies process, ingestion, delivering studio viewing copies, uh, learning uh, the depth and breadth of roles and how badly we had botched them at the outset, um, and then bringing it all together at the end, turning over to sound, turning over to visual effects. There was about 700 odd visual effects in the movie, uh, doing the titles pretty much all the all the front titles and some of the end titles were done in Final Cut, and that was the actual titles that we used. Um, you know, you mentioned something really interesting yeah. when you you just mentioned you know how you botched it in the beginning, and yeah. and I think one of the number one things, whether it's a small project or a big project, is to really map out that workflow ahead of time. And frankly, that's where you know having access to guys like Sam and stuff, because people who have done this, you. A lot of times, you don't know what you're doing wrong until you're well past doing it wrong. Yeah, well, I think you have, yeah, everyone makes their best guesses on stuff, you know, and we made our best guesses. Years of experience, you know, I've been doing this job and other jobs for many years, and the other people involved, and Sam, and until you really stress the software, 
you don't know what's going to happen until you really stress the system. You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, but I'm not even and, talking yeah. about the software. I'm talking, regardless of what yeah. software you're using, I'm not saying Final Cut doesn't yeah. do the job. I'm saying anything. You really have to, you have to think out, you know, where's the media come in? Where does it get backed up? When does it yeah. go to color? When does it do this? And it's really important to do that. But anyway, that's a good thing. So. Yeah. You have some more more than this. You want more than this? I want. I want to know. So um, walk me through this. Okay. Well, this is uh, when we started shooting on the Alexa. The whole movie shot, except for about five percent, shot ProRes Quad Four, two uh, K twenty forty eight by fifteen thirty six, and uh, one point three anamorphic. Because it was that anamorphic, we had to de squeeze it uh, outside of Final Cut. And uh, we let's see what do we got here. We went uh, into Final Cut from. The, uh, from the trans codes, there was this, some light iron components in there called live play. People didn't use that a whole bunch. Uh, when we were working in New Orleans, it was all run and gun, trailers moving around, and we were all our systems were isolated but synchronized. So we had every system had a 32 terabyte uh, Thunderbolt RAID hooked up to it, and we went from just we were sure that everybody lined up at the end of the day, and we synced up the editor stuff and our editorial stuff just to be sure everyone was on the same page with dailies. Uh, we pushed stuff out to the studio. We took stuff to the trailer when necessary. The editor was about half the time in the trailer, half the time in the cutting room. Uh, be, they wanted to be close on set. And when, you, when you say trailer, you mean just like a physical I mean a trailer physical on set? physical trailer that okay. at the end of the day, we, we had this trailer. Just for a second, I thought you were working on the, the commercial. Oh, yeah, no. Well, <laughs> okay. uh, what was really cool was we had, uh, apparently this was a trailer that uh, Michael Kahn had used, so it was a very high-end trailer. And we had everything strapped down in there, like IMAX Velcroed to the wall, monitors bungee corded in, and they would have to shut down every day about an hour before wrap so the Teamsters could come and hook the trailer up and drive it to the next set wherever they were going. And sometimes we had the good fortune of having like one or two or three days on a set. Like, I don't know, those of you who've seen Focus, but uh, all the stuff that was in the Super Bowl, Super Bowl was uh, shot some the, the on-field stuff was shot in the Superdome, and all the stuff in the luxury box was shot at the old NASA facility out in New Orleans, which is they used to house uh, gigantic rockets, and now they have stages. And so there was giant green screen stuff built there. So we were there for about a week, which was great because nobody had to move. Yeah, moving is tough in the middle yeah. of the job. Yeah. Okay. So then what? And so uh, yeah, let's move. Uh, and it's weird. Some of this goes way back, but we, you know, we we prepped our stuff. It was easier, uh, actually, in those days to break out components of Final Cut, and uh, and take things apart. So we were like emailing cuts and emailing stuff for dailies. Now you have things are a little safer than when we did it. Then are you going to the next slide? Um, we moved one more time, Chris. See, nothing happened here. It was <laughs> darkness. Um, we moved into post after all the shooting was done, moved into our triple wide trailer on the Warner Brothers lot in LA, and we had an XAN. We had pretty much all IMAX. We got a Pro, uh, Mac Pro very late in the game. We were living, uh, all the media was on the SAN. Everybody had a local drive with their uh, libraries and proxies for those who wanted them, and uh, a couple other ancillary things. And all I can say is if you're going to work with local drives, SSDs are the way to go. Um, there's a beautiful SSD up from Buffalo, a RAID that we used that made all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. there, we had, because we were passing things between, um, between editors, we had, uh, all, we had a library on the SAN, and the SAN libraries performed considerably slower. Uh, once we figured all this out, we were all working on locals and passing things around through the SAN, and a few of the things that we learned are now firmly in place in the current version of Final Cut, and uh, it's super helpful. Um, and I think there's three things that I thought you guys might want to talk about today. Uh, sound turnovers, because everybody has to deal with sound, and visual effects, how we, the things, tools we use to trans get stuff to visual effects, and how you actually move things between, uh, between systems, between editors. That's one of the big things that people complain. It's not a multi-user environment, um, but it is, and uh, I thought, I like to talk to people. So, what do you guys want to talk about first? We want to talk about sound, sound because sound is the next slide. Okay. So, what sound. exactly? What exactly do you mean by a sound turnover? Well, you got your picture department and you got your sound department, and sound is uh, they do edit the dialogue so it sounds beautiful and perfect. They do the sound effects. So, 
it explodes loudly, and they incorporate the music that, that comes in. That stuff doesn't happen in real time on the no, set? No, it does really? not, Chris. This okay. is new for you. I know that. Um, and so we have to be sure that they have accurate information going forward so they can do their job and fill out the tracks, smooth out the dialogue, cut in the effects, put in the music. So it's all beautiful. And uh, it looks and sounds good. And sound, as everybody in this room knows, is probably more important than picture a lot of the time. So uh, you want to go ahead to sound? Sure. I don't know where that slide is. These are the ones I made myself. You'll see a really cool flash of a Final Cut slate, maybe. And then it goes away. Cool. Um, this is a super uh, simplified version of what we did, but it's really not that difficult. And the elements that we used uh, when we turned over for sound, uh, we made a reference movie, common, every day. Everybody makes reference movies. We put a time code burn in using a free plugin from Alex uh, 4D. Uh, which didn't exist, and this is one of the cool things. I had emailed him and asked him if he could make a foot and frame counter because there isn't one, and he, uh, but he said it's really difficult to do. And about 48 hours later, he sent me something that we <laughs> use for almost the whole movie. And he eventually said, "What are you doing with this?" And I said, "Well, I'm doing this and this and this." And I sent a screen grab, and it was time code and feet and frames, and uh, property of Warner Brothers and real number one A with the date and the version or whatever. And so a couple days later, he sends me one back that includes all those things in one, uh, one yeah, plugin. Mo most of Alex's yeah. plugins, he says, take him about 30 minutes to yeah. do. So if it took him two days, it was it really was tough. tough. It was really tough. But uh, so the, what you see on his website now, it's called the feature overlays uh, we use uh, extensively. Uh, he built one that I think he's going to uh, actually charge for, which is a frame counter that we use a lot for visual effects as well. But um, super cool. So we would export our reference movie with the overlays. We would use Final Cut and the rolls to export separate uh, dialogue, music, and effects guide tracks for sound. And uh, there's a little, uh, we le I learned about panning laws when we were exporting our guide tracks. I don't know if anyone you know, anyone, who knows about panning laws? OK, great, one person, two people. <laughs> um, learn about panning laws because the short story is when you export your dialogue, and your music and your effects, if you're working in a surround project, as we were, export in surround. And then uh, you'll, there, it, there's this business with levels and how things behave when you pan them. We don't have time for that today, but you talk to me afterwards. Um, so we did our reference movie. We did our, our stems for d with dialogue, music, and effects for sound. Uh, we made an AAF uh, out of Final Cut, which is fa fantastic. It does not provide panning information, which uh, the Avid will, but uh, Working on the Avid is so, I, I'm so over it that I don't care. Um, <laughs> our change lists, uh, change list software was made by uh, Phil Hodges and Gregory Clark, who are maybe in this room, but they're intelligent assistants, smartest guys you'll ever meet. Uh, and they figured out how to uh, make change lists with the Final Cut XML. It says simplified there, as you can see. And what that means is, and this is the same story with any NLE, you are going to make a basic timeline, take out speed changes, take out certain effects, take out things that, uh, will, uh, that can't be reproduced on film, because this, this goes all the way back to film. Uh, and um, same thing with for EDLs. And then we zip up one big package and send it off. And one of the cool things about F Final Cut versus Avid, and I haven't spent that much time on Premiere, but much of this stuff, like all this can happen at the same time. And then all this can be done while that's exporting. Mm -hmm. And so by the time you get done exporting, you've got your entire turnover for a reel. And that's kind of cool. For those of you who know Avid, uh, you know you export kind of a piece at a time. You, you have to figure out how you want to do it. But is it enabled tracks? Is it uh, what's inside the marks? Uh, turn things off, turn things on. Where's my music? Where's my effects? Uh, I have some music and effects on the same track because I ran out of tracks, for those of you who like track-based editing. Um, <laughs> and so uh, Final Cut is. Uh, it's one of the best things about it is for sound turnovers because you can, in movies you, and TV, you spend a lot of time creating an environment with, for sound. And you don't have to worry about how many tracks, where things are. You just have to worry about that you've told the system what it is. And dialogue is called dialogue, and effects are called effects, and music is called music. And then there's all, these are roles, and there's all sorts of sub roles and categories and new roles that you can do, like visual effects and final visual effects and ADR and, and Foley and whatever. And you say export, and you can export everything of one kind or multiple kinds, you can tie them together really easily. And for any of you who have worked on Avid and Unwound, 
the 24 tracks that you have on the Avid that are on a complex feature, it, it's a nightmare. I once recently uh, had to output uh, DM&E &E, uh, dialogue music and effects stems from the Avid. It took me five hours to untangle these tracks of this 30 minute segment, uh, sequence in an animated film. Literally would have taken me 10 minutes in Final Cut. Literally. Uh, and uh, I, I'm a big fan, so I'm going to get off that soapbox for right now. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, how, how did you box the roles in early on in the project? How did you learn about that later? Um, we were uh, working with Light Iron, and we were all sort of learning together. Uh, and Light Iron uh, was <coughs> taking IXML data from sound people, which is uh, we want to put that into sub roles and putting it in main roles. And at that point in time, and still, roles are permanent. So you bring a role in, and it's there. It's, you can get rid of them, but it's not easy. And so we ended up with things that were roles that should have been sub-roles. And as a result, because we wanted to give relatively clean tracks to our sound people, ended up just turning most stuff into dialogue and not being able to take full advantage of the, uh, the roles because our sub roles, we did, we we found out a little too late that we that we didn't get it right out, out of the gate. Mike, can you give an example of how you would use sub roles? Like like what type of sub roles would you generate? Okay. Um, all right. We're shooting this scene between you and I. You have a microphone. I have a microphone. There's a I, microphone you don't need a mic. I'm hanging over our head. Okay. And so there's going to be three audio tracks, probably four, because we'll do a mix track of all those microphones. Each one of those is going to have a role. You know, mi mono mix, Chris. Matzdorf and boom, or something like that. And so each one of those is going to be a sub role of dialogue. Each one of those is going to come up as a track and final cut. Each one of those within uh, a single clip. Uh, you've all seen Final Cut where you have a single clip and it contains picture and sound, right? Yes, OK. So you open that up, uh, expand the, uh, expand the uh, components, and all of a sudden you have all of your tracks laid out. And you can actually checkerboard, turn this section off, turn this section on, turn this section off, turn this section on within a clip, then collapse it all down. So you can isolate people's microphones, cut up stuff really cleanly, and then fold it back just into the one, into the one piece that it is. And then when you send that stuff out, all those sub rolls and rolls are put out to different, uh, different tracks in Pro Tools or Logic or wherever. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's an example of where you would use the rolls, use the sub rolls to cherry pick the sound that you want and isolate right. it on an individual track for the uh, sound editors. It's like, once again, I say this all the time, Final Cut 10 solves problems for editors that they don't even know they have yet. Yeah, and they don't appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, should I go forward on this? Uh, you guys have any more questions about sound? I just want to define the, the yeah. role sub role thing. So, so essentially, like, the primary role, role would have been like dialogue, and then the sub roles would have been those, uh, those elements from those different sources. Well, it could be microphones, like your, your oh. microphone, my microphone. It could be like ADR, I'll put as a sub role of dialogue, okay. um, VO, okay, yeah. stuff so like that. Yeah, just want to make sure yeah. I have that hierarchy correct. Yeah, yeah. Right, thank you. Yes, sir. Hey, Mike, Um, the mixers, that's a little down the chain from what we're talking about. This stuff is going to go to sound editors who are going to going to give it to the mixers. I found that most sound editors, they're interested in breaking things out by uh, person, microphone, mic type, and this, we're kind of providing that to them. What they'll what they would get is they would get you know four channels of dialogue, and then they'd have to go in and, and identify it and do it by hand. So it's kind of saving them that trouble. Nothing's ever going to be exactly the way somebody wants it, wants it, but this gets them, at least the elements are separated. And what we were doing on Focus, just for, um, for, uh, to help out, was we would do what's called a clean AAF. So we would only give the roles that were enabled. So if I had five microphones on a clip and four of them were turned off, it would only give the microphone that was on. So we'd give the, the enabled, and then I would give one to include the disabled. So then they would have stacks of things, however many microphones, which makes for a messy AF to, to work in. But if you want to go find something, instead of having to load up the take, find the spot, find the microphone, you can just go to the cut and then look down, uh, look down the stack and see, oh, I want this mic instead of this mic, or these two instead of this one, something like that. Yeah? Um, some people want EDLs. And uh, we would, the problem with EDLs is they're limited as far as the number of tracks are concerned the amount of information that you can uh, hand out. But the EDLs we provided was because the sound editors wanted to reassemble from the original sound roles. 
because we were had uh, embedded audio in our QuickTimes, and this was part of our discovery process, getting back to the original uh, information, we, we couldn't just give them the audio out of Final Cut. We could, and we did, but they're like, oh, we need to go back to the originals. It was identical. But uh, they needed EDL information to track that stuff back <laughs> to the original roles. We'll do more Q&A at the end. Let's uh, move forward. Next slide. What do we got here? Effects. See that? Slate. Slate, yeah, that was, that was a visual effect, right? Yeah, that was beautiful. Um, some of this is uh, uh, focus related, and some of this is beyond focus related. So um, anybody worked on a visual effects show? <coughs> Hands off to Nuke, uh, After Effects, anybody? OK. Um, so again, pretty simple, straightforward stuff. You make an effect, you give a, people a reference movie so they know what they're looking at. Um, we used these two products, which were, again, the intelligent assistance guys, um, to do count sheets. Anybody old enough to know about count sheets, lineup sheets? No? OK, good. Uh, telling the artist what happened in the effect. You know, this is the background. This is a car entering. This is a car hitting a deer. This is so wherever things happen, that's where the count sheets are, by the frame, source frames, uh, record side frames. Um, what if we had changes within a reel in respect to the visual effects, we would provide a change list so people would know to update their effects. Uh, same story with an EDL. One uh, thing that we didn't use uh, and is kind of newish is the clip exporter, which if you have a Final Cut project, effects are all built out, you can export it directly into After Effects or Nuke, and it'll look pretty much the same way if you're using R3D footage uh, or the uh, ProRes, uh, any of the ProRes, I guess, it will make duplicates of the media with handles to send off in a project. It's a really clean way to deliver an effect with all the information really quickly. And um, it was super helpful for, for me on a couple of things after Focus, but we didn't use it on Focus. And Next. Visual effects, anybody? Anybody care? Okay. A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. We go back to after effects. Yeah. Yeah, well, th that utility is, is really helpful. And it, since it also handles MXF media, if your camera it originates MXF, or if you're working on MXF media, like you, you, it works on the Avid MXF. There's so many different flavors of MXF. Um, but um, it's super helpful just for getting the message across. You want to be able to, exp it, it's to, you can write it down, you can show them visual, but to explain, to be able for them to see it right in front of them, it's, it's helpful. And then they can recreate it in a way that's not quite as messy as an editor. Uh, oh, yeah, extensively. I mean, we used SliceX. We used uh, some of the stuff from uh, FCP effects. Um, we used, there was a bunch of plugins that we used. Um, and I think we would do our best job. And a lot of that stuff lived through previews. I mean, we had three public previews and two in house previews. And most of the effects were kind of, for the first couple, were almost entirely Final Cut. And then once we knew they were going to stay, our effects guys were turning over. Uh, stuff And just one thing about uh, effects which just came to mind, thanks Wes, based on what you said, was um, this is one of my big pet peeves about budgets. And I don't know who cares about budgets around here or if that's your department. But since you can edit with original media now, and you can use tools like this to get your effects through the pipeline, and you, a lot of shows have visual effects uh, people working from relatively early in the process, all their salaries, all that time is going towards final, finished stuff. Because I'm working on a show right now, for example. It's an Avid show, DNX 36 Media. And there's six visual effects people working, because it's a really big visual effects show. And every single thing they're doing is temp. And every single thing that com passes muster for final will have to be redone. If they're working in an environment like this, with uh, high quality or original footage, they could be working for final. And so that's a big consideration for me when I think about my projects, because I want to be able to not waste money. Yeah. Uh, and that's this, like, it's under $100 for this software. I don't know exactly what it costs, but it pays for itself in about 15 minutes if you're on a show that's, uh, that's that kind of a show. OK. Um, this part's a ramping part. Did you do any, like, any major speech changes to any one of the Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, we. Some of the stuff that was uh, the, speed, the speed changes and the speed ramps with the optical flow, um, a lot of that 
was carried all through the previews. Some of it carried all the way to final. I don't remember exactly how many shots, and I was trying to remember what it was recently, but um, I do remember that we had a shot that looked better in final cut than what the Pablo at Light Iron was able to do. As far as no, no, the the issues that we had, and there were there were a couple. The issues that we had were like importing and exporting XML, sort of choked up on those sometimes. Um, but uh, I think that was more the optical flow than the speed change. Uh, but in respect to like turning over, translating, getting it done, no, not at all. Um, originally, the intent was to use Resolve a lot, and we didn't end up using it, uh, I think, at all. Yeah, well, we, we did most of the stuff in Final Cut and then went to Pablo. We thought we would, we would want to do some of this, these uh, easy visual effects or comps or whatever in Resolve, but it just never ended up happening. You mean a basic extended whatever? I have no idea what they mean. Or maybe, um, maybe, maybe Phil and Greg can, can uh, tell me a little bit. Okay, All right. uh, Sam, do you do you want to come and get get involved in this? Do you have anything let's you want to ask about this? One, Should we wrap up? Okay, let's spend two minutes talking about this next thing, and then we'll we'll parlay. I like to talk, Sam. Passing Don't data. Don't shut me down. Passing data. The, yeah, good. Stop on this one. Everyone talks about how do you get cut from one machine to another. Okay. Right. I made this sweet graphic. Um, sweet, so sweet artwork. Let's say this is an editor. A is an editor and B is an editor, and transfer is on a SAN. All right? Everybody with me so far? Okay. You got an event with a cut, and you move it to the, you take that event with a cut, and you move it to a library on the SAN, and then you have the cut and about a thousand clips. All right? Anybody experience this? Anyone moving between systems? Great. Okay. Um, and Go to the next slide, Chris. Go, go to the next slide. Okay. So what you want to do in this instance, see that slate? Um, the, way, the way to cleanly do this is once you get into your transfer library, which everybody needs to do, isolate the clips in their own event. See the yellow circle? And then move the cut to the B library, which is a copy of the A library. And then everything is safe. Everything is beautiful. There's not a whole bunch of extra clips. Uh, I really should have thought this out more. Is this making sense to anyone? Not at all? Does anyone pass, pass edits back and forth between? OK. Yeah, it is. <laughs> there should be a book about this. Did you guys have it so you would open the one on the, the SAN? You'd open both the libraries, you'd have them both, and you'd do a move function? Or were you doing an XML export from A and then? What we did and what you should do is a different story. What we did was messy, and it was, uh, there were problems with it at the time. All the problems are fixed now. Um, basically, the, the idea, if, when you guys are moving cuts between systems, you want to move the cuts in an event. So you want to move events. You don't want to move edits. And I'll make this quick, because I know Sam wants to get on to the next thing. But you want to you move events. And when you, when you move something into its own event, it's going to want to bring everything with it that it needs to play. And if everything that it needs to play is also in the final destination event, only bring the cut into that into that event. That's the simplest way I can say it, and I hope that makes sense. But people always have questions about this as far as how, what's the magic step. And that's the magic step right there, is to isolate the clips. Is all the media stored on the yeah. Sand? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so if I, if I think we should, let's move on, because I think people have some questions. Sam, why don't you come on up here? OK. Um, you should probably finish with the last couple of slides, Mike. Mostly, what? I'm like, I'm not saying you need to stop. Just let's keep going. <laughs> Keep going. Well, there's just not that many slides. All right. Well, let's, let's talk. Who wants, who wants to have some open questions right now about what goes on? Let's have a seat. Let's have a seat. All right. Look um, at that. So Sam, plug. I'm in the middle. I'm just going to come over here and hang out. All right. So I, I, can I ask you about the transfer thing? Yeah. So what you're saying is when you bring a project, when you try and move it to the transfer library, yeah. Final Cut is going to want to bring all the associated media. All the associated clips. Clips. Yeah. And by separating the clips out into a separate event, you can move just 
the edit information essentially. So here, if you did not have an identical uh, event structure, basically, um, when you passed a project, so you just dragged a project into an event, it was going to bring all associated media, and it would bring all of the media, and then you'd pass the project back to another library, and it would bring all of the associated media over. So the way you would get around that was that you would have the media and the, like, the event structure identical between libraries. So you could just duplicate this right in the finder, and then you'd have identical event structures, and then you could move or copy in an event, either containing a single project or bringing identical media, and then all of the media would reference in there, and you wouldn't have duplicate clips that would start populating your library from dragging stuff across. It was messy. A little bit. Anyway, it's much better. Now. However, yeah. <laughs> however, the mess that you were experiencing was partly due because you were using versions prior to 10.1.2. Yeah, usually when you do a test, you want to have like isolatable variables. Right. And we had so many variables at the time, uh, and we kind of we had to figure things out. So I, I think that w what we discovered was how to be safe about it. Right. And. Um, the copy and move events commands are your friends, really, is kind of what we learned. Yeah, under the, final, under the file menu, you know, that's somewhat t contextual. If you have a library selected and you hit the file menu, you're going to see different things in that menu than if you have an event selected. So keep track of that. Um, contextual menus kind of bother me sometimes. But what he's saying is use, use those copy and move commands as opposed to trying to drag and drop. Now to take that even another step further, um, the consolidate command in Final Cut 10 is really powerful. And especially the way that hard links work, you can take your media and have it basically be identical but be in the Final Cut directory structure and have it live completely separate from all of your original camera media. And if you hit the consolidate button, it's going to consolidate across the same drive on a network so that if you were then to back up to another hard drive, all you would need to do is copy the one Final Cut directory of media. This is, I may lose a couple people, but your bottom line is you're going to copy <laughs> one folder from one from the server and put it onto a, another folder from uh, on an internal hard drive, and you're completely backed up with a single file that you need to relink, and it's all in the Final Cut 10 directory structure, and it all lives separate from your media which is all in its original directory structure. So nothing's been touched. And this only takes up the amount of copies that a single file would take up off of your, your media. And this is through hard links, which is, which is something else. So I, I think one question that I always want to ask, I want to hear from Mike is, um, today we're looking at Final Cut 10.2. We got the cool new features. You've all been hearing about that. And again, if you haven't, get a smartphone. Uh, and, but you did this in 10.0 and 10.1.1. The, the subsequent releases have just made it easier. Would you still, today, if you were starting Focus again, given the software that we have, you'd still go to Final Cut 10, right? Primarily for all oh, the yeah. time-saving stuff. Uh, well, I'd, I'd go to Final Cut 10 because it's easier to edit than anything else. <laughs> OK. Um, you know, it, th there's many things which make it good, and there's many things which make it great. But I just think it's, if I want to edit and I spend my time being creative, I can spend the most time being creative right. in that because I have, if if we're thinking correctly as we enter a project and as we start to begin our days and our dailies come in, and you do your homework. And there's not a lot of homework to do, but then it's just easier to edit. It's easier to trim. It's easier to manage cuts. It's easier to make changes. It's easy. It's just easier. And I don't want to. I want to spend my time being creative. I don't want to spend my time. Okay. One last question, and yeah. this is off topic, and we, I have not discussed this with anybody else in the room, but this was really big on social media a couple of day or two ago. Uh, rumors had it, and I'd like you to address it publicly, <laughs> that Apple was delivering big piles of money to you because you chose to use Final Cut 10 on this project. Is that true or not true? <laughs> As I said on Facebook, uh, to Yo, we read what you write on, read on Facebook. It's utter bullshit. Okay, um, and I'd be happy uh, to talk to anybody about it. Okay, yeah. so I just want to set that aside. Anything else? Uh, I mean, I think the 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 key lesson here is is Mike is you know um, moving forward since then, and and the the truth of the matter, the, the key to focus was that like it was um, you know the beginning, and it happened. A considerable amount of time ago, you know, and and the truth is that all the, it worked then, you know, and it worked in ten point oh point nine, and it worked in ten point one point zero, 
and it works really, really well in 10.2 that just came out today. And, and I think the point is it's the evolution of these tools. And if you really look at how these tools are evolving and, and the platform that's being created around them, it, it's a compelling case that like, you know, you should use your own eyes when you look at these tools and, and come to your own conclusions about what they can and can't do because they can pretty much do anything you want them to at this point. And I, I think just to add one thing to that, like we, we had a, every time we saw an update for Final Cut, the reason that we updated, like Chris was saying, project it's, a, it's, crazy it's town. a bad idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, the reason that we updated because the updates were generally exactly what we had asked for, um, and they are listening and they do listen. And I know the, I know that people they read the feedback because I've seen like my feedback show up in places, and yours will too. So I think. You know, it's just it's good software and it and it works and that's why we updated because it got better and it got better and now, you know, everything that that I wrote down for this it still applies but there's hopefully there'll be less and less of it that people will need to know because the media management's better the uh, fluidity of sharing projects is better it's just uh, it's really come a long way. Well, and I think really the thing about Mike's book too is. Um, it's it you don't really get lost in the technical details so much as it gives you a primer to transfer from maybe how you've been working in a Final Cut 7 environment and how maybe some of the new rules apply to a Final Cut 10 environment and how to transition to to that and I think that's sort of the key is like once you understand how how the world works you know you're able to do it once you know what your your strengths and limitations are you know exactly what you can and can't do and that's really the key to being an effective editor, I think, at the end of the day, is knowing your tool. So uh, a couple more questions right here. Uh, on the aisle. Um, oh, um, what, oh. what kind of features would you like to see added? Added? Dude, we just got 10 to. Can you enjoy it for like a day? <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. <laughs> no, I, I actually haven't played with the release of 10 to, so. I, I want I want it to make my edits better. <laughs> Todd, uh, oh, uh, okay, I'm sorry, over here first. Um, you you both had to spend a lot of time, uh, as I understand it, convincing the whatever group of suits at Warner Brothers that okay, this is going to work, and they gave you okay, fine, go for it. Now that you've been through it, have you heard from any of these people and have, have they said, yeah, okay, good, we have no problem doing this? Can't this get back on the lot. Um, <laughs> Can't get back. Uh, <laughs> No, yeah, I mean, they were uh, they were concerned because it hadn't been done, you know, and um, we showed that it had been done, with, that it could be done on a small scale. Uh, we had to fix a few things on the large scale, but yeah, they were they were all happy at the end of the day. One of the people, one of the post people there said, "Oh, this is the best looking preview I've ever seen," it's because it was 2K right out of the box, um, and so they were they were pleased at the end, and they were also kind of shocked when we turned over the archive of the, in, there's an entire movie uh, on one of those 32 terabyte Eureka drives that's plug and play uh, with 2K. And so uh, there's a lot of, there was a lot of advantages to it. But yeah, they were, they're fine. They now, they now know it's cool and. Did, 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 in, I, I happen to know that, that uh, there is another film. There's more than one film. They're already <laughs> editing at that same studio. So. Yeah, well there's, one, yeah. More, there's an additional one there. There's more than one in the wild. I mean, at the end of the day, this really isn't controversial anymore. It's like basically the first time around, it's it's hard and no one wants to be first. But now that it's been first and you can point to something, it becomes like, oh, well, what do we want to do? You know? Yeah, Todd. Todd, you had something? Oh, it was real, real quick. I'm just curious about um, I, one of the things that, that the, the reality of this, it seems to be that the, um, there's now more time, uh, less time in the, in the setup and more time in the creative side of things. And so I, I was just curious of, of what maybe with some of the sections possibly that had a little more creative time that because the, the, this tool was so much, so much more efficient than, than, than the same workflow that's been done before. You mean, you mean what goes faster yeah. for me? Um, Everything. Well, a, a, simple, a simple tail trim on a shot with com complex audio beneath it. it takes 10 seconds on, five seconds on Final Cut and takes a minute on the Avid because you've got to figure out which, everything, which ones to open up so you don't lose sync. And those minutes add up. So I would, there, simple trimming is, is a huge, huge deal for me. There's a question way in the back over there. Um, you alluded to this a little bit uh, with the roles and audio. I do post audio, and you see a lot of issues with the roles coming through. And do you 
you alluded, maybe there's a little light iron magic in there in terms of DIT and how XML from the sound devices gets to the roles. And so can you talk a little bit about that? There are like actually... a lot of editors in the room, and I, I get a lot of stuff where none of the roles are taken care of at all. I would like to show you a demo. Um, but within that, there is a fantastic tool. Uh, Greg from Intelligent Assistance is in the back. And there is a tool that, by nature, Sync and Link 10 will apply automatically a role to an audio component when you run it through Sync and Link, so that this is automatically going to have a role attached to it to import to its own track in uh, Logic or Pro Tools or wherever you want to go. So you can deliver a beautiful looking AAF to people. Um, and it's just a question of how long it takes before the concept of roles right. becomes the... Yeah, let me, let me just be specifically respond. I'm sorry, I'm looking right through this crack in the crowd right now. Thank you. Um, the old uh, adage of garbage in, garbage out, okay? That, that still applies everywhere in the world. And one of the assistant editor's jobs is to be sure that the roles are correct when the stuff comes in. Same as like the tape name is correct, the key numbers are correct, that this is correct, that that is correct. So it, that's one of the jobs that people need to do. There are tools, as Sam said, to automate that. But you still needs to be checked. Some people didn't even, don't even know about roles, uh, to be honest. And other people do it at the tail end. Like I just worked with a guy, and he, cut it, he didn't care. They cut his entire project. And then when he went to deliver, he went and identified the roles in the timeline. So I don't think it's the right way to do it. But I think one of the things that I would uh, question I would like to see is you know roles on import. You have to. You have to uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you you know that that it's mandatory because that's it's the key to delivering. You shall a, not move forward. Thou shalt not. But it's um, it's key to delivering a clean show and not mucking up the works on your end. And that's really the key principle throughout in Final Cut 10 is the more time you spend at the beginning of your edit just to get organization right in your browser, the smoother this is going to be when you get to the very end. And um, for instance, Brian over here is going to have a presentation tomorrow where they put some of this into practice. And if you guys want to see kind of the next evolution on some of that, come to the Final Cut 10 for Indies and see what they were doing on set to, to ensure delivery out through. We have one more question in the backpack. Uh, I was wondering whether during editing process you used the Compound Quick feature and uh, whether you had any problems of moving this Compound Quick to any other software? Um, Compound Clips. We, yeah, we used Compound Clips here and there. Um, in the beginning, in the 10.08, 10.09, we had some issues, not issues with Final Cut, issues because I lost an event, uh, and the <laughs> Compound Clips was in there, and I, we had to, I had to run and hide and fix it. <laughs> um, so I've had issues. But uh, you know, we, we used them when we needed to, and usually during any kind of delivery, that's, the, that's one of the things you simplify and break apart. Um, it, it's a convenience during editing to make, give you a little more screen real estate, but when you need to deliver, you need to break it apart. They work better than they used to over XML, but test before you go. But earlier, you, you were talking about synchronizing the three editors when you all were in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't sure what you meant by that. I was just being sure the same stuff was on the drives. OK, the same, they had the same media? Yeah. Yeah, so it was yeah. a situation, instead of having centralized data that all, everybody was hitting, each person had a, a clone of the data. So that was synchronized, yeah. yeah. Um, within the, uh, we use Carbon Copy Cloner, pretty much, yeah. But we, it was, we also just, we were doing everything at once, like, all right, did you copy it? Yeah, copy, did you copy it? Yeah, copy, did you copy it? Yeah, okay, good, we're copied. Let's now, go to you, lunch. Is that licensable? You know. can, can you license that, that yes, technique? Yes, yes, trademark. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, do, we, do we have time for more? We, 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 it's it's uh, 248? Yeah, let's go to 55. Okay. All right. Brian. Yeah, Brian. Um, you mentioned you transported media before bringing it into Final Cut. So did you do a more typical online-offline structure, or did you do the online-offline within Final Cut? Um, because we, had anim we were shot anamorphic, uh, we had to de-squeeze before we brought it into Final Cut so we could edit. Okay. Um, why, why is that? I would think Final Cut can do that. Why? Is, I, is I think it can do a 2.0, but we were a 1.3. OK. okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Because if you're editing a sequence and you click on a clip and you do shift F to uh, re root. it then it goes to the root event and I don't like I, I like I love working in keywords in a single event because it's super it's clean and it's easy but the matchback thing kills me 
And I think at this point with the library model, um, you know, you can start looking at your events largely as bins at the end of the day. And then the, the keywords, because they travel from event to event when you pass media, it really doesn't matter where the keywords live because you can find those keywords from the library level and then just use events as, as another way to, to organize and limit what you're looking at. And then you can go in and add favorites, keywords, and metadata on top of that. And, and so there's so many levels to drill down that having an additional sub-level at the event level, I think, is, is beneficial. And it's also a good way to separate out your projects and some of these other I, things. I, I'll give you one other reason. It's because like, if you want to take home like a block of three scenes and you have an event, an event for each one, it's a little easier to just like deal with. So, Because you'll use the copy event to another library, and now you take that library home with you. Yeah. And you can cut for the weekend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, the li having the libraries on the XN was was uh, the, I don't it's something about the way the data packets run. I don't know. It's just it, I think it's an XN thing or maybe a, just a SAN thing in general. So you'd prefer to use a lean library that you keep local with the data elsewhere. Um, if you're working on a on a SAN in general, um, especially XN, uh, you're going to want to keep your libraries separate from the SAN and just keep your media on the SAN and, and keep, the, keep the libraries as lightweight as possible. When I say lean library, do people know what I mean? It's a, it's a term that I, we kind of came up with on the podcast where you, you strip out all the media out of the actual library file and you store it under the, um, uh, inspector, the library inspector. You can choose an, an outside folder to put the cache and the renders and, and you know you can use your leave in place. Your library file then ends up being measured in megabytes instead of gigabytes and it's much easier to move around and yeah, copy. And in. well and with the way like the way it works now, you can have a library that's totally empty living on the sand, put something in it you need to move and then and then pull it into the other machine. All right. So, so you just use the sand to bounce things around and you edit it all locally? Yeah. Hold on, who, who wants this, that back there, no questions from there yet. Could you use a lot of tracking in the timeline to modify scenes? Uh, when you say tracking, do you mean version tracking or t uh, element tracking with like slice X and stuff? Yeah, 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 their stuff's really pretty great. We used uh, Core Melt and I think once or twice went into motion for something. But uh, yeah, Cormelt stuff's all over the place in that movie, all over the place. The actual Cormelt renders made the final cut? No, during, during editing. D during the editorial yeah, and but they made, they We previewed, like, there were a couple of face replacements that we did with the slice X tracking where it was, you know, two people having a conversation and we, there was, like, the wrong person walking in the background or something. So we replaced their faces while they were, you know, moving and having a conversation. Seriously? Yeah, it was really cool. <laughs> I don't we, believe anything in movies. Face anymore. replacement, <laughs> trademark. <laughs> okay, uh, back to the green shirt, yeah. Um, going back to um, making a transfer of the library, um, I'm kind of a more fundamental level, but I, I, but I think I'm, I'm not getting it. If, if, if I'm leaving my, my media in place on the server, let's say, and I'm copying a library or Bring over the associated files immediately. What are we bringing over here? Okay, uh, exactly. what's your system of, what's your normal editing system? Well, in my case, I'm not working on the I'm just on a. No, but do you work, have you worked on an Avid? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. So, like, when we say move in media, we're saying clips. So, like, if you move a bin from one machine to another on the Avid, it's just moving that text it's file. Right? Yeah, it's just moving information. So, that's what we're talking here. You can choose to take proxies and optimized and uh, along with you, but you don't need to, because you're just taking the references. You're taking, you're taking the text, XML, whatever the information is, from one place to another, and that's why it's relatively small. So the media is the clips, the little clip references, or instances, or whatever they're called. Does that I make guess, sense? Yeah, I, I guess I don't know why that would be such, why that would be uh, a multitude of this or a big file. Oh, we're gonna do one more, then we'll unplug Mike's book at the end. Um, I don't know all the technical business of it, but I do know like when you want to match back, you want to when you if you're in a cut and you want to say show me this group of clips here, you want it to go to a particular place, right? right. 
okay, if you have these extra clips, the ones I mentioned, that may not happen. And so that's the, that's the danger. It just creates a, a messy working environment. So it, it makes duplicates of your clip of, of, of that Yeah, it's, uh, I, it's like a second instance. It, yeah, in yeah. I wish I had knew the exact terminology so for it, but yeah. Not that bad. Can we do yeah. one more question right here on the aisle? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So during the whole chain, when you started ending with the D squeezed, you just kept all names the same. Of the, of the, you know, how did you keep track? Yeah. Yeah. Fi file names and embedded time code. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you weren't ever dealing with proxies, really? Oh, we we used proxy. We we made proxies within Final Cut. Yeah. And we edited on proxies, and then but it all tracks back. It all carries the same info. So a couple last things. Michael actually did indeed write the book. We have a slide we're going to put up. Uh, take a look at that. And, and just out of curiosity, in this room, how many people are cutting in Final Cut 10 on a regular basis? And how many people are here, put your hands down, how many people are here aren't using Final Cut 10 but are like, eh, you know, maybe this idiot did a old movie, maybe I can do it too? Anybody? Good. We got, got the one. team here. Over here. I want to talk to you. <laughs> All right. So check out his book. Thanks for being here.